I am very happy to join this session and to share a few thoughts with you. Particularly, I think uh, today for our meeting, most of the participants are from the theological fraternity. So I feel more firmly that we belong to one uh, group. I thought that I would begin from my personal experience and then I will share with you how I read Bible over these years. Um, many years back, when I started my teaching in the theological college, once when I was visiting the Union Theology Seminary in New York, that was about 35 years back, and when I was sitting and talking with friends, I saw in the common room in the notice board uh, saying that all gay friends meet for Bible study on Thursday, 6.30. Then I read another notice saying all lesbian friends we meet for Bible study on Tuesday, Sunday. That was something new to me, I should say for a student from India, student of Bible, that time, it was simply something look, look new to me, I would say. I did not have anything to react, but I still remember that was an experience. When you confront with some new experience, that experience begins to germinate and bring new life in your thought process. And then after five years, I think, when I was teaching in Manchester, one fine morning, two students in the theological college, one of whom was a very close friend, they declared that they are gay. I could not uh, really believe that two theological students can declare openly and then uh, when I was talking to them, uh, one, I still remember one thing he shared with me, I want to be honest before my God and before my people. That really impressed me. And then slowly, I was uh, trying to grow with these things, I would say. And basically, I just want to share that I was a liberation theologian from the beginning. And my whole theological premise was built on one thing, he in solidarity with the people. I never knew, frankly, to share with you that the people with other sexual orientations were suffering because we live so much in ignorance in our world. Later, I was exposed to uh, Jewish studies. And there I came to see the connection that Hitler, during Holocaust, wanted to destroy three factors. One was, uh, you know, the gypsies. The one was the Jewish people and the third was homosexuals. Then I thought that definitely in history, the rulers have identified as targets these people to be terminated from this world. There was a scientist who was working with Hitler. He suggested that we can find out in the embryo of the mother, the womb, whether the baby which is going to be Bond will be homosexual and it can be eliminated even in the you know, fetus. That was something new. These are all of some my conversion experience in life. Then I begin to read by my work, by including the other sexual orientation and their sufferings as part of the, my liberation stories liberation struggles. Even then, I was ambiguous. I was not sure whether I was traveling in the right direction. That time, 
I was viewing a television interview uh, with uh, Bishop Chibu. It was the Lambeth Conference. All the African bishops voted against the homosexuals and the draft resolution was defeated. But uh, Bishop Tutu was the only supporter of this uh, movement of the gay and lesbian. And the press persons are asking the uh, Archbishop of Anglican Church, a bishop of newer magnitude, do you not think that this affect your uh, image in this world because you have voted for them? The that day, I till today remember, he said one verse to the first person, first person, if I did not stand with my gay and lesbian brothers and sisters, the liberation struggle I waged all my life will go without any meaning. That touched my heart. That gave me clarity for my journey. And from that time onwards, consistently, I have included the gay lesbian brothers, transgender brothers and sisters in my interpretation, in my uh, hermeneutical principles. And uh, so now I have shared a little bit how I have been moving in my life. So what I shared with you did not happen overnight. And it all started 35 years back. And uh, I would consider these things as moments of repentance in my life. And uh, till today, like I speak for anti-Semitism, I speak for women's liberation, I speak for my black counterparts, I speak for uh, people with other sexual orientations. Having said this, now I want to begin with uh, some of the biblical things. Uh, what I want to share with you may be a little bit sporadic, may not be too systematic, but I am sure uh, this will help us all to only clarify who we are, clarify where we stand, clarify how we see our context. And so let me begin very briefly. First, I want to say some hints how I will be moving. Some of the things for your, uh, just you know, throwing some bits for your thoughts. There are about 32,000 verses in Hebrew Bible the, which speaks about human sexuality. But uh, I see only five verses which directly refer to homosexuals. That means the way they use Bible for homosexuality against homosexuality is out of proportion. You will see. Bible simply does not mention at all. Or I would say Bible is not too serious about it. When there are 32,000 references about uh, sexual behaviors of human beings, how come you only discover not more than five? Very few sacred texts of all religions mention homosexuality. Leave alone Bible. You take other scriptures, you will be surprised the Quran has only one place to mention about homosexuality. That is what I hear. And uh, in Bible, nowhere I see that it condemns the same-sex marriage. It never condemns from the beginning to the end. In fact, Jesus never spoke anywhere against other sexual orientations. Uh, even within the heterosexual, I should say, I does not see this simply as a sexual behavior, but it is part of the power structures. And uh, the, the powerful 
they have always identified the powerless as their targets. They do not create powerless, but there are powerless in this power imbalance. And uh, that also, I would say, um, this uh, Bible, even among the heterosex, because the, the powerful were heterosexual, the other sexual orientations were always minority. So the majority people, they justify their sexual behaviors only by disproving the other sexual behaviors. Because they do not have the clarity of their own behaviors. In that way, the other sexual orientations are homosexuality, began to be targeted. And uh, for example, I would say, what uniform structure they have for heterosexuality in Bible? Uh, there is no uniformity or consistency, but how our uh, people champion heterosexual relationship and how they derogate the homosexual relationship is unjustifiable. That does not have logistics. For example, I say in one place in Bible, it says she had five husbands. Whose husband she will be? Some place, seven husbands. And another place it says, ah, this is in the Good Samaritan, five husbands, the one who is with you now is not your. There is another one in the Old Testament. There will be seven women. They will ask one man, we will look after your life. Can you be a husband over us? Tamar, she could marry three sons in the family and finally end up with the father in law. Abraham can have two women in his life. Jacob will have four wives in his life. Lot's daughter can have incest with the father and create a nation more. I am not questioning this actually. These are all social memory in the Bible. But what made them to remember this? And what made them to preserve these things? These things were not taken away. That means somewhere we can have some kind of systematic understanding of human sexuality in our Bible. Even, I would say, uh, the out-of-context interpretation. <clears throat> that is one tool used against the sexual minorities. And usually, you know, the persecution of the homosexuals, it can begin as ridiculing, excluding, and forcing them to alter the behavior. Even there are imprisonments and even to the extent of the executions. This is what we say, what right the majority have to exercise these kind of infringements upon a minority people simply because the way they are endowed with their sexuality. Because the power structure, it needs some scriptural justification for them that is why they need things. In fact, this did not uh, begin in the, from the origin of our history, or early times of history, post-colonial period. They were the ones who master minorities throughout their place and the colonized country. Psychologists, they do not say that this is a mental disorder. And there will always be some people, the readers of the Bible, who do not accept science. So they do not take the science ideas 
in order to change their uh, views. Values of tolerance and acceptance of others must be there in reading the Bible. That is what I would say. And uh, many religious groups, they have not found it difficult to extend tolerance to LGBT people. And uh, also, many people are not opposed. Uh, they are opposed to violence as to the gay people and other things. These are some of the backgrounds we have to understand that how far we are tolerant, how we are, we are against violence against these people. That is what I want to raise before we read the text. I will read the text. I will bring some controversial text for you today. And I will show the hypocrisy of the interpretations of these texts. But this is what uh, culturally I would say, uh, LGBT people have always been in, uh, in our society. Uh, Alexander the Great, he was known for his bisexuality. And uh, the great emperor Hadrian, he was a homosexual and he had a male partner. And they were all accepted in society. And uh, Plato, in his symposium, he has accepted that God has created three genders. Men, women, and androgynous. That means all these people, they were all uh, were accepted in society and it is uh, remembered in human history. In fact, I would say that uh, it was uh, King James who has criminalized the homosexuality along with the burglary act in 1533. And he was the one who brings the King James, King James version. And uh, we know that the one who criminalized homosexuality and the Bible which uh, very much is against homosexual translation, against homosexuality, that king was a homosexual. He married Robert Carr, and then after he died, he married his longtime partner, George Williams, who was a commoner, and then he made him the Duke of Birmingham, Buckingham, in 1623. So these people who sponsors Bible are who were in the world when Bible was written, the readers were very much uh, in the same-sex relationship and it was accepted in society. With, with this background, now I will come to some of the uh, texts which uh, we usually read. I will say, I, before I begin some of the Old Testament texts, in a systematic way, let me begin by saying some of the places in Old Testament where you can see that the same-sex relationship has been accepted in a way. It was not a hindrance for the writers of the Bible. And yeah. First, I would say in 1 Samuel chapter 18 verse 1 to 4 there is the David-Jonathan relationship. And I, I think I should read one or two verses. The soul of Jonathan was bound to the soul of David. Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul, Saul, sorry, and he loved him as his own soul, stripped himself of the robe that he was wearing and gave it to David. 
Uh, if you have read this uh, between Jonathan and a woman, then you would have clearly told Jonathan was in love with her. But uh, here, then it is between Jonathan and David. Uh, then we have difficulties to accept that uh, Jonathan. One more verse I read. In the dinner table, when Jonathan was trying to uh, plead for David with his father, Saul, you read that in 1 Samuel 20, 30, Saul is scolding Jonathan, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you have chosen David, the son of Jesse, to your own shame, the shame of your mother's nakedness, this is a common talk in the dining table between a father and a homosexual son. Clearly says that you have a homosexual relationship with David and we are ashamed of your uh, relationship. Then I would also say yeah, that uh, in Ruth, the language is clearly, it would be the same sex language. Warpa kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. There is even, you see, there is a comparative of their affection. Uh, it is something more than kissing. And uh, clinging is almost a euphemism for uh, bodily relationship. And here, you know, she speaks like a wife or a partner to the husband or husband to the wife in a heterosexual. Your people shall be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. This is a terrific language. Uh, who cannot be separated in life between two women we cannot categorize what was the relationship, need not categorize, but clearly says that they had such a deep and intense love between both of them. I think uh, even uh, in the gospel, we are very surprised to see that that Roman centurion who comes to Jesus to heal his servant in Matthew 8 and Luke 7, he uses that uh, word, pious. And that word can have three meanings. One can be a servant, one can be a son, adopted son, or another one, an honorable servant. And clearly, they say culturally, they use this word for same sex, uh, same gender sex. And interestingly, when he uses the word, the word pious, he might have thought even if he did not declare it to Jesus, Jesus might know that by his supernatural power. And uh, when he was telling Jesus, there were other people near Jesus who were not happy with this centurion that inviting Jesus to a house where homosexuality is produced. And now, like all uh, other sexual orientation, brothers and sisters, this centurion is anxiously looking how Jesus would respond. Will he not say, oh, I cannot come to your house where you have such bad practices. But Jesus was, you know, saying, I will come to your house and let me heal him without any hesitation. Jesus fully approved that relationship. And when that man says, you need not come to my house, I don't deserve. But if you say a word, it will happen. Now Jesus can go to the extent of saying, 
I have not found such faith in Israel like this person. That was terrific acceptance of this uh, person. And also we see read in Acts that uh, by Holy Spirit, the Philip was led to go and meet the Ethiopian eunuch and preach gospel because he should become part of the kingdom. The kingdom of God cannot become complete without uh, the people at the margin entering into the kingdom by violence. That way, now I think I have tried to establish here and there uh, some of the things uh, for our discussion, for our thought, that uh, I would like to say, when I read Bible like this, it does not look to me anywhere the way the people, the heterosexuals, look at other sexual orientations. So I have a feeling that there is more space for them within the biblical literature. They are not uh, sent away. They are not expropriated. They may be in the borders, but there is space and it can be increased. Now I come to some of the basic texts which are used against uh, homosexuals. Uh, one text which is always used against them is the creation text. The creation text, uh, it says that God created Adam and Eve and he created male and female. This is one of the strongest texts which is used in support of heterosexual relationship. No problem in that. But against anybody who do not follow this heterosexual relationship. Lot of work has been done on this uh, text particularly the friends who belong to other sexual orientations, they try to dig deep into the text. Actually, according to the original Hebrew, um, Adam was a hermaphrodite, and the rabbis have accepted it. Um, one half was Adam, one half was Eve, and they were united in the back. And if Adam and Eve were uh, created as uh, uh, no, heterophrodites, God was also because they were created in the image of God. So creation story is not a heterosexual uh, supporting text but it is beyond heterosexual. It is not against heterosexual, but it is beyond. So nowadays, I think almost all the students of Bible, they at least accept in principle the interpretation, but interpretation varies. There can be plurality of interpretation. Only thing, we should have a measuring rod for our interpretations. Jesus had a measuring rod for his hermeneutics. That was love God, love your neighbor. Whatever we interpret, it should be in love. Second one with Jesus had as his hermeneutical principle, Torah should liberate, it cannot oppress. It should free, but it cannot bind. In both the principles, we can see that we cannot use scripture texts to bind a human, a group of human beings. We cannot read Bible 
in hatredness for a community unless we clear this hatredness for the homosexual brothers we will not read bible in love if they are struggling for their freedom if they are struggling for their liberation i think they have better truth than others secondly there are two verses in leviticus that has been used as the most powerful weapon against uh, all the homosexual friends i read in leviticus chapter 18 verse 22 do not lie with the male like you would lie with the woman since this is an idolatrous perversion and there is another verse leviticus 20 13 If a man has sexual intercourse with a male person, like as with a woman, they have both committed a koiva, that means abomination, perversion. Their death is their own fault. So these two verses, you know, it is like a hammering insistence. You hammer against them. with these two texts now we have to get the help of some of the important teachers how they interpret this uh, text and uh, yeah uh, i will take uh, yeah one by one and first of all i will take uh, one a very leading uh, teacher uh, in old testament joe milgram he has written the commentary in leviticus about 850 pages what is his specialty he is a cultural anthropologist and he has read uh, these texts again and again and then he comes out with uh, certain things these texts first he says were originally written not for the people but for the priests this is one important uh, thing people are not excluded for this relationship but uh, some reason the priests were excluded according to this text that's all and then they say this is written in connection with the idol worship of the surrounding people that there was a cultic fertility rituals there was male prostitution female prostitution and those times the male will have relationship with male female will have with female in the surrounding nations because in the surrounding spirituality same sex was venerated same sex was honored but as a polemic to the other nations when the israelite scripture writers scribes wrote whatever they do we cannot do that is the a norm of this writing so if their priests are doing our priests cannot do that if that is done in the idol worship context whatever belongs to that idol worship we cannot have that so that is uh, the second point they say then he say there is no word in the whole of the hebrew bible for homosexuality how can you say homosexuality is not allowed there is no hebrew word at all for homosexuality so this is something discovered out of the bible say bible says adultery is not allowed bible says theft is not allowed there is a word for adultery there is a word for theft there is a word for idol idol but unfortunately or fortunately 
our uh, Bible readers have missed to note that Bible has nothing to say about homosexuals. And uh, sometimes it speaks with euphemism. It speaks with indirect words. That is true. I cannot disagree with that. Uh, there are many places. For example, I would say, uh, like, you know, uh, Loth's, uh, sorry, Nova's son, he did not hide the nakedness of his father, can be an euphemism that, uh, you know, uh, he had a homosexual or some kind of uh, activity. And uh, see how the ruling class, uh, they want to curse Kanan, and so they have discovered this as a reason for Kanan, uh, because this is anti harm spirituality. Harm must be cursed. So they discover this as a uh, uh, so, there are many places where it is only indirectly they are uh, told. And again, uh, those times, all the males were commanded to marry. And it was a heterosexual society. In that context, they did not know possibly they had to accommodate the same-sex relationship. And hence, these verses might have come. And uh, yeah. Interestingly, even you take that uh, this text is against male with the male, there is no place in the whole of the Hebrew play, Bible against the lesbian relations. Even if you think that gay relationship is condemned, that means it was a patriarchal society and marriage was centered on the male. So there is a commandment how male should marry, but there is possibly no uh, way a woman is forbidden to marry a woman. That is not coming. And interestingly, later in the rabbinic period, a lesbian was allowed to marry the chief priest. A chief priest can marry, he cannot marry a widow cannot marry a woman for second marriage in heterosexuality, but he can marry a woman in lesbian relationship. This is also very interesting. Um, if one partner is bisexual, that is not uh, rejected in this law. That is also part of the and uh, yeah, see once more, you cannot lie with the man as lying with the woman means you cannot use other person for your sexual gratification. You cannot lie with the man thinking lying with a woman. Or you cannot lie with the woman thinking you are lying with a man. That is sexual gratification. We are not honest to the person with whom we are lying. So this is perhaps we have to be honest with whom we are having relationship. Thinking somebody and to relate with somebody that is less than animals. Even animals do not do that. That kind of sexual uh, gratification is not possible. Cannot substitute for a woman. That is another interpretation. You can take a man, but you cannot substitute for a, take as a man. 
but do not substitute for a woman that is also not honoring this uh, relations so first i discussed with uh, the creation story now we discuss with the leviticus text and then i want to discuss with the north the story and um, there i think uh, we know that loth is getting two strangers and he wants to give hospitality and in the middle of the night a mob comes to loth and they ask loth to uh, allow them to have sexuality with his guests and loth wanted to protect the guests because it is part of the hospitality and this so the we has even become a term for homosexuality but actually uh, in later text like the essential it clearly says that uh, he was a judge lord and these people they might have come there they came for judgment and uh, the people in sodom were oppressing the poor people that is what ezekiel says and the judgment may come against them so this is a kind of threatening the guests with homosexual activity and uh, even lot goes to the extent that you can have heterosex with my daughters but do not have homosexuality this is the whole interpretation of the text but this is very much against the whole story if uh, this homosexuality brings judgment how much more the incest with the father must bring judgment if sodomites were destroyed for homosexuality next day lot and his daughters must have been destroyed by the same logic how can god bear incest that means that the story itself is there to say here sexuality is not the problem the problem is power the oppression of the poor that is the problem of lot story but this is again one of the example how we can use this text against uh, this people uh, by the text uh, yeah. um i think yeah it is taking time uh, more or less i think i have discussed with uh, some of the things in isaiah that isaiah we see about the inclusion of the humans the non male female relation people are with other sexual orientation kingdom of god must include them into the temple they cannot be excluded so that is giving something of the final vision we have a long way to go the struggles of the other sexual orientation friends will conquer one day because it is human history that oppression has never conquered only liberation will conquer if that is so the this liberation will also be victorious one day as theologians as bible teachers somewhere we must experience a conversion experience to read our bible and hermeneutic our bible in love with these brothers and sisters in love with all the other people with other orientation so i i would i would with all convincement would say hebrew bible it is not anywhere against other sexual orientations our eyes are biased we have to open up our eyes and uh, i thank once again reverend jodi for this uh, nice opportunity uh, to share my 
convictions uh, with you. And uh, if there are anything you want to add, we can do. Thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Uh, John Samuel Annan, for a wonderful uh, you know, thoughts that you brought from the Old Testament. It was really mind blowing to learn to those uh, aspects uh, from the Old Testament. A lot of misunderstandings we have, but your explanation, your setting of the background to the Old Testament, uh, um, given us some kind of uh, understanding on it. Thanks for that. Friends, uh, we are running short of time. We have left over another three or four minutes. So, if you have any questions to ask him, please ask him. He's available to tell us. Maybe we can just uh, go another five to ten minutes. Kindly bear with me. Any questions, please? Yes. Thank you, sir. Very wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you for your wonderful insight. Uh, could you please explain uh, me about Noah and Ham on Genesis 9? How, how can we look this text, Noah and Ham, on Genesis 9, 20 to 27? Thank you, sir. Uh, and then we will collect all the questions first and then yeah, we can. Yeah. Perfect. I think that would be better. Yeah, any other questions? If you have any other questions? Ali, not going to speak. No. Anybody else? No one? No other questions? Okay. Uh, then we will ask. Uh, Dr. John Samuel to answer the question raised by William Charles. Um, yeah. Um, within the biblical text, there are many texts which are polemical texts. Uh, one principle of hermeneutic, we have to find, identify this text favors whom and against whom. This particular text is a text in favor of the shame and their descendants, and it is against harm and their descendants. This, this is a polemic story. And uh, when you want to curse harm, you have to discover a story, a myth. This is very common in our culture. Uh, if, uh, I, if I permitted, I will tell you a parallel story. In one of the Indian village, there are two communities. And one community does not believe the other community. You ask the community, they will say, uh, their grandfather and our grandfather went to agriculture. And uh, first, uh, their grandfather said, when the crop comes, whatever is on the top of the soil, it is mine. Whatever is under the bottom of the soil, it is yours. And he sowed rice. So all the rice went to him. So our grandfather told him, why did you cheat me? Then he said, next time, whatever is uh, on the bottom, that will belong to you. So you will not be cheated. Sorry, whatever is on the top, the other story. And next time, he put potatoes. So he was expecting that uh, all the uh, things on the top will come on him. Now potatoes went to him. And telling the story, they will say, we cannot believe them. We don't know whether this story happened, but there is a story myth to strongly make them not to come in solidarity with the other group. This is the mm. trick of the dominant people. They can create so many myths. Likewise, in Bible, you can never come in solidarity with the black people. So there has to be a permanent injection against them. Then you have to tell a story. Then you tell the story. See, 
he played with his father sexually this is not homosexual but playing with the father the relationship playing with the mother is condemned playing with the brother is condemned see the story was now this story is taken as a weapon against our homosexual brothers this is euphemism i i mentioned so this is a parliament it was once used against the black brothers are now used against the homosexual brothers so this is where i would say we have to identify how a biblical scripture text works against the oppressed people uh, how we cut ties the freedom i think i make uh, clear up what i was meaning to